Okay, let's do it. Hi, yeah. hello. Welcome everybody who's decided to join us. This is the Corn Creek Watershed Plan EA public scoping meeting, a mouthful, but we're here. It's a public meeting. So in this meeting, we're just gonna talk about um, what's going on generally. And then, so we're gonna give that presentation and then we're gonna give everybody here uh, the opportunity to ask questions or provide comments. I'm being really general right now, but I promise we'll get more specific. Um, Lane, if you wanna go to the next slide. So like I mentioned before, uh, participants are gonna participate. Attendees are gonna participate via the chat on the right hand side of your screen uh, as shown in this cute little screenshot right here. And so you're welcome to send in questions at any point in time during the presentation. I, as the moderator, will see them, make a note of them. I'll keep track of them. And then when it comes to Q&A, you'll be first on the list. So you can send in questions at any time. Lane, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Perfect. So the purpose of this meeting, we are going to inform y'all, the community, about the study in NEPA process. We're going to invite and encourage public participation and feedback. That's also you guys. Um, basically, we want your feedback about the project supporting it, if you support it, if you are aware of any water resource needs that we don't talk about, or if there are environmental concerns that you want to share. That's, that's you guys. That's why you're here. Um, and just as a note, this meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, so if you're having technical difficulties, don't worry, too, don't worry too much. It's going to be recorded and then it's going to be put on our project website, the, the one right here listed at the bottom of this slide. It's going to be put there for you to watch within 24 hours of this meeting. It'll probably go up tomorrow morning is when I'll put it on there. Um, so you can come back, you can watch it, you can show your aunt, your dog, your horse, Sharing is caring. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So I'm going to do some quick introductions. Um, this project is being led. We're getting funding from the NRCS. Um, and on the NRCS side of things, we have Norm Evanstead, Derek Hamilton, Wayne Yuri, and Jason Dodds. Jason Dodds is here with us in the chat as an attendee. Wayne Yuri is here as a presenter. Um, and Derek Hamilton and Norm Evanstead unfortunately had some conflicts in their schedule. Um, for the project, the main sponsor is Kanosh Town. Frank Paxton is the mayor. And then co-sponsors include Corn Creek Irrigation Company. Uh, Corn Creek Irrigation Company and Kanosh Town. A couple different ones. And then the project team includes Lane Jensen and then Monique Robbins. Both of them are on the call. And then myself, Eleanor Chambers. And then also on the call, we have we have technically Brandon Stevenson heading things up for us in City Hall. And we have Brandon George. So next slide. So I think I'm going to turn the time over to Wayne. He's going to talk about the NRCS and then We'll go on from there. Does that sound good? Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll provide the background on what the uh, watershed protection and flood prevention program is and uh, how it works. And then uh, I know there's opportunity for you to ask questions. We can do that later. The USDA, the Department of Agriculture, through the Natural Resource Conservation Service has had this watershed protection and prevention, flood mm. prevention program in place since the 1950s. But the uh, financial part of it was taken away in about the early 1970s, and it's just came back to fruition in a little while ago. So uh, it's to provide financial and technical assistance. Technical assistance is a big word for help to protect to project sponsors who are states, local government entities, and tribes to protect and restore watersheds. For this instance, we've got Kanosh Town 
is the main project sponsor and then the concrete irrigation company is another sponsor. And then when we assist with planning and implementation of these authorized watershed projects and they go through quite a bit of work in order to get it planned and, and all the economic analysis, cultural resources, uh, and those kind of things, environmental analysis before it can be uh, listed as a plan. It's undertaken, there the slide says, the request of the local sponsors who've asked for our help addressing natural resource and related economic problems. Uh, the Kanosh town with the help of uh, the engineering firm as their consultant submitted a proposal to us and then we provided some guidance on how to make it uh, the best plan they could in our National Water Management Center in Little Elk, Arkansas, they decided to fund it just a year ago. So that, that's the way the program set up. Can you give me the next slide there, Lane. Okay, why a watershed plan? Well, one of it, one of the things has to do with the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA compliance. Uh, it has to go through the NEPA process, the National Environmental Policy Act compliance, in order to be uh, delineated as a plan. It's called Public Law 83-566. It's just the name of it. <clears throat> it has to go through the principles, requirements, and guidelines of that particular law. There's eight separate purposes that the uh, PL 566 program is earmarked for. First of all is flood prevention. Next, watershed pr protection, public recreation, public fish and wildlife, and ag water management, M&I or municipal and industrial water supply, water quality management, and watershed structure rehab. And as you can see there, there's a little asterisk that shows the cost share or the natural resource conservation share part of it. And so each one of those eight different separate project purposes have a different uh, cost share percentage that the NRCS pays for. We do pay for all the uh, uh, planning and design, but then the construction is split into those different uh, percentages. So that's that's the way the program works. That's the end of my part. If there's questions right now, I think we'll move on to, I think it may be you, Brandon, is that your part now? Oh, sorry, Brandon, you're going to have to unmute yourself. So that little microphone button at the top. Nope. Hey, Brandon George, is that you? Okay, is there somebody else who can help uh, Brandon out? Talk about this slide, I mean. I can, I can do that since uh, Brandon's having some technical difficulties. Uh, this is Lane Jensen, project lead for the consultant. Uh, the purpose of this slide was to identify the process which I can, I can do that. Can you hear me now, Lane? Oh, you can now. Yes. All right. Go ahead. I'm the right thing. Sorry. I'm Brandon George at the Water Board. Um, they asked me to talk about what uh, concrete 
why we wanted to do this project. Uh, we've known for a while with the dam safety that we need to do some work on our dam. Um, so we want to do some work on our dam. Uh, our system is out of date. We lose half our water getting it down to the fields or our cement ditches are um, they're just worn out. They're broken. They're in unrepair. And we've wanted for a long time to go to a pressurized system and try to get some uh, water storage. We get all of our water way earlier than what the uh, farmers need it for. And along the way, we have found, we've also figured out that there's no water recreation on the east side of the county. Delta has some on the west side, but there's nothing on the west east side. And we've looked at a few things there of something we'd like to try to incorporate if we can to get a little water recreation up there. Um, and we've been working with Francis Engineering for a year to get this going, and we're pretty excited about getting some flood prevention and and pressurizing the system. So. That's where we're at. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, as the, the sponsor of the project is Town of Kanosh, so Corn Creek Irrigation Company and the Town of Kanosh work together to prepare the application and are working together during this planning process and will be working together throughout the whole uh, the whole project. So Kanosh, most of you probably know where Kanosh is, having lived there, but it is uh, central Utah. Fillmore is the probably the closest town that most people would recognize, having driven down I-15. So during the application, in the application process, some purposes and needs were identified. And Brandon alluded to some of these, uh, flood protection, improved agricultural water management, and recreational opportunities. Some specific items to address these purposes were the, the seepage issues at the existing debris basin, the dam safety engineer in Utah has identified a seepage issue through the foundation of the uh, dam for the debris basin. So in the, if the debris basin is full of water, water is seeping underneath the dam. And if enough water flows through the foundation of the dam, then the whole structure could fail, causing all the water that's in the debris basin to flow towards Kanosh. So we're looking for ways to not only take care of those issues at the debris basin, but also to divert water around Kanosh instead of through Kanosh. We're also looking at groundwater recharge. So a lot, right now, a lot of the water during the winter months is just going out, spreading out, evaporating, and seeping into the low, the shallow aquifer that's not really beneficial in many areas. So we wanna look at recharging the deep groundwater aquifer that is providing municipal water and also agricultural well, water. The shallow aquifer, it's not really beneficial in many areas. So we're looking at recharging the deep groundwater aquifer. I think that is Brandon Stevenson. Oh, okay, he just muted his mic. Keep on going, Ling. Okay, and then as Brandon alluded to, the pressurized irrigation system or would like to get a pressurized irrigation system to conserve limited water resources and also to make irrigation more efficient 
and finally look uh, to create some recreational opportunities. This map here on the right is the Corn Creek watershed and Kanash is right in here. You can see my cursor and then you can see the agricultural field surrounding Kanash. I'll show some maps that show us a little better. This is a map that the Utah Department of Dam Safety created. They do some modeling to find out what the impacts would be if a dam was to fail under different circumstances. So the red area that you see here is the area that would be flooded if the debris basin was to fail. And you can see pretty much the whole town of Kanosh would be flooded if the debris basin was to fail. So the warning from uh, Utah Department of Dam, Dam Safety is uh, a serious matter for the town of Kanosh. Uh, depending on what's happening, when the dam fails, water in Kanosh could be anywhere from a foot to three feet, three to four feet deep flowing through town. So that could cause significant damage. So conceptual ideas that were included in the application are bypass pipelines, building a new reservoir, routing flood flow around town, and in installing a pressurized irrigation system. Now it's important to note here that this is the planning process and even though it wasn't identified in the application, our what was identified in the application is not necessarily what will be built. This planning process, the purpose of it is to identify the most feasible option that meets the purpose and need, as well as being the most financially responsible option. So what I'm presenting here is most likely different than what will actually be built eventually because going through this process, planning process, we hope to find the best solution to meet the needs. So uh, I've mentioned on the flood prevention side, what we'd like to do, uh, in charge, improved recharge of the aquifer. On the agricultural management, we'd like to improve the water supply and crop production, provide pressurized irrigation so that there's no longer a need to have pumps and ponds and to uh, increase reliability of water deliveries to the town, to the irrigators, as well as to the uh, Paiute tribal lands. And finally, another hope is to provide some recreational opportunities at a proposed reservoir. Here's a little larger map. So hopefully you can see my cursor. This kind of pink line is a bypass pipeline that would, during low flow conditions, take the water from approximately where the forest server's boundary is, put it into a pipeline and take it around the debris basin. Measurements have showed that during low flow conditions, up to half the water is lost in this section of the creek and going through the debris basin. So by putting in a pipeline during low flow conditions, you can double the water supply for the town and for the irrigators. Next aspect would be to rebuild the debris basin to be larger and to take care of the foundation seepage issues. Uh, the reservoir would provide storage. As Brandon mentioned, oftentimes when the water is available, it's not needed. And when it's not available, that's when it's needed. Uh, the reservoir will provide some storage, which will provide recreational opportunities, hopefully like a sandy beach where people could canoe, kayak, paddleboard, and also uh, if a conservation pool is possible, uh, maybe a fishery, some, some fishing habitat. 
as well. These, these ye this yellow line and blue lines, orange lines and green lines are the various pipelines that might be associated with a pressurized irrigation system. What we're looking at is putting some of the flood water into these pipelines. So we're making them a little larger than might be necessary just to convey the minimum flows available so that under flooding conditions, the pipelines can take the water out to the fields and distribute the water on the fields because this basin is a closed basin, which means all the water that comes in the Corn Creek, comes in Corn Creek, doesn't leave. It just goes to a low area in the valley and evaporates or seeps in. So by spreading the water out on the fields using a part of the irrigation system, we're able to reduce the flooding down in the lower areas of the valley. So for example, if you follow this red line, right now high flows go out into what the locals call the sloughs. And if there's enough water, it starts backing up and damaging the surrounding agricultural lands. So what we'd like to avoid is damage to any of the properties. The reservoir will help in floodwaters, but there will still be a need to divert floodwaters around the town. Currently, you can see in this uh, light blue line is the natural channel or the historic channel that comes into town, makes a sharp right-hand turn into a concrete line channel through here. Once it hits the, the highway, it goes through a culvert into a smaller dirt channel. And by the time it gets to here, it completely disappears. So high flow now would come into town and eventually would have nowhere to go. So what we're looking at is diverting the water around Kanash. And that is this red line. This would be a flood channel that takes the water around Kanash and gets it down to the slough area without causing damage to the town or the agricultural areas. And the location of the flood channel is undoubtedly going to be refined during this process. So I think those are the concepts we're starting with and as we'll be working uh, to refine those and find the best solution to the needs that have been identified. I'll turn the time over to Monique to talk about the planning and NEPA process. Thank you, Lane. Um, my name is Monique Robbins and I work with grants and civil engineers. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the purpose of NEPA, which is an acronym for the National Environmental Policy Act. And where these funds are federally driven from the NRCS, it triggers the environmental process, which is what we're going through right now. And this phase is the planning phase. As Wayne mentioned, there's three different phases. And the planning phase is very beginning stages where we are assessing um, issues and needs of your community and what can be done, different solutions and ideas, and um, gathering all of those so that we can make the best possible project for your community. And part of that is public participation where we are asking for your input, your support, suggestions, ideas, um, if you've seen any issues or concerns, um, any of those. Uh, factors that play into the analysis are engineering standards. NRCS has standards, the state has standards. So there's different standards that we will be um, taking into consideration as we go through the process. Another part of the analysis is an economic analysis where we look at the benefit cost ratio and making sure that the benefit is greater than the cost um, to best benefit your community. 
Uh, we go through um, and work with different governmental and environmental agencies as part of the process. We had an agency scoping meeting yesterday to help identify um, information that's available and help that they, they can provide uh, as we go through. And then the last is looking at environmental resource impacts. And if you'll go to the next slide, it has a list of a lot of those resources that we will be considering as part of the process. Go ahead and click link, there we go. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that we're looking at. We're looking at soils and wildlife, cultural resources, environmental justice, uh, air quality, water rights, a lot of different things that we're looking into um, as part of the, the resources that we're considering. Next slide, please. So the NEPA process has, as Wayne had mentioned, the three different phases. We are in the planning phase. So as Lane mentioned, you know, we have some conceptual ideas that can help with the issues that have been identified to this point. But in the scoping process, we're really looking for any anything else, ideas, solutions, ideas, concerns um, to help with uh, the process as we move forward with the planning of how best to help um, your community with the, the issues that are going on. And the planning process takes typically 18 to 24 months. And we're at the very beginning right now, and then there will be another public comment period when we have the draft environmental assessment ready. And that will be sometime late this year or early next year. And we will also send out notification to you so that you can have a look at where we are at in the process at that time. The second phase is the design phase. And that takes place after we have the final document um, in the planning phase. And that's usually nine to 12 months process. And NRCS will pay for 100% of the planning and design phases. And then as we move into the final phase, which is construction of the project, there's different percentages like Wayne mentioned. So for flood protection, just to review, that's at 100% that NRCS will pay for. The agricultural water management components will be paid for 75%, and then any recreational components are paid at 50%. And that is all contingent on funding. So there's currently funding that's been provided for the planning phase. And then as we move forward, NRCS looks at basically the pot of money that's available um, and then determines whether there's funding available for those design and construction phases as we um, move forward. All right, next slide. So the next steps um, are gathering information, gathering comments, and analyzing the comments and the information that we get and the existing information that's out there. And we'll develop some alternatives, um, whether they look the same as what Lane showed us or some variation of that, um, we'll, be, we'll be developing those. And then we look at the different resources that were the list uh, that I showed a few slides ago and seeing how the alternatives will affect each of those resources. And the design actually has a 30% component uh, where we will design enough so that we can have a cost estimate so that we can do that economic analysis and have that benefit cost ratio of the project. And then there will be a draft environmental assessment that is um, put out for your review and the agency's review to, to comment on. And then the final result of the project is to have a decision document, which is the final environmental assessment. And uh, the, there is a document called a FONSI, which um, is a finding of no significant impact. And at that point, then they can move forward with uh, the design process. Next slide. So how you can submit comments. We're in a comment period, which is for 30 days, and it ends on May 28th. You can, uh, if you're in person, we have some papers that you can write your comment on. Uh, if you are, um, you can mail that comment to myself. Um, at the address there at France and Civil in American Fort, or you can send me an email and we'll compile all of those comments. And you may not hear from us for a little while, but we're taking those comments in and assessing those and looking at them. And then we will be responding to those um, down the road. 
Next slide. So here again is my contact information and we put a screenshot of our website because we will be updating our website where you can find information about the project um, as we move forward, we'll keep it up to date so you can kind of see where we are in the process. And it's right there at the top right. You can see the Corn Creek Watershed Plan EA. Um, if you click on that, that's probably where you went to get to this meeting. Um, but we'll keep that page up to date uh, with information. So that's how you can contact us and keep up to date with the project. All right, so now we have finished um, what we had planned to prepare for you. And if you've got questions and answers, I know we've got some questions in the chat button and Eleanor will moderate those for us and read those to us. And then those of us on the panel can answer those questions. Perfect, thank you, Monique. We have some questions that came in. Um, some of them from Todd that we may have answered during the presentation. So Todd, you're gonna have to let me know. Um, one of them said, if this program hasn't been active and viable for some time, what other watershed protection and flood prevention projects have you done under this program? And Leslie in the chat did provide a link to the NRCS website that has the whole list of PL566 projects done in Utah recently, some of which Friends and Civil has worked on, some of which other uh, firms have worked on. So if that doesn't answer your question there, Todd, let us know. And then similarly with the your question about the dam, exactly what is the problem with the dam? Have any such problems been documented? And I, there's a report that reflects the assessment and problems of the dam. I can take that. So the Utah Dam Safety Engineer inspects the dam on an annual basis and uh, prepares a report each year. And in that report, uh, Dave Marble, who's the dam safety, Utah Dam Safety Engineer, has identified the foundation seepage issues. Uh, Utah Dam Safety keeps a list of dams that are in need of rehabilitation, and they list those dams by priority, uh, which dams have the most risk associated with them. The Corn Creek debris basin is not on the top of that list, but it's fairly close to the top of that list that uh, Utah Dam Safety keeps. Um, when we were preparing this application, we reached out to Utah Dam Safety and uh, Dave Marble provided a letter of support for the efforts to rehabilitate or rebuild uh, the Corn Creek debris basin because of the, the problems that he had identified with the uh, current dam. Hopefully that asks your question. So there is, there is documentation. Um, it's independent of myself, the irrigation company, or the town of Kanash. It's the Utah Dam Safety Engineer that has come to the conclusions that these efforts are needed. Great. And then another question, I think, Lane, this is for you, because I know that he sent it in while you were talking. What is your definition of sustainable? That could be a hot topic on sustainable. <laughs> uh, sustainable, in, in my mind, is something that not only looks at a single need, but looks at broadly, broadly at the needs of the community and does not ignore one group to the benefit or detriment of another group. Also something that um, takes into, effect, into account environmental impacts and minimizes those impacts and something that lasts for a significant amount of time. So you don't want to spend millions of dollars to build something uh, to go to one of your comments about sediment that fills up with sediment in a year later or two years later or something to that effect. Uh, I can address the, the sediment one. That is always a challenge with on-stream reservoirs is sediment load, and that has to be addressed during this planning process. Uh, one of the 
alternatives identified in the application was an off-stream reservoir. And an off-stream reservoir water could be diverted that was did not have a high sediment load associated with it. So that, that will have to be one of the alternatives identified. Uh, during the agency coordination a meeting yesterday, it was identified that we need to look above the debris basin and look at the health of the watershed itself. And so there may be aspects of the project to improve the health of the watershed so that the sediment loads in Corn Creek decrease. Uh, so there's not this the challenge of filling a reservoir with sediment. So there's a lot of things to look at and we're just starting the process. So it's good to identify what issues there are so that they can be addressed as part of the planning process. Cool. Um, and then a question that I huh, flows into, I gotta make, I gotta not make puns, that's not professional. Another question from Todd, if the low flow pipeline bypasses the debris basin, how is water from the reservoir going to get into that system during the late summer? So that all depend the the low flow pipeline would connect to the pipeline coming out of the reservoir and using valves um, would control how the water gets into the system. So for example, um, you might use the reservoir some periods of time then use the low flow pipeline you might use the low flow pipeline to put water back into the reservoir uh, to, to get that water past the section where you lose a lot and put it in the reservoir and then it would go into the system as it normally would from the reservoir. There's a number of options uh, to use that, um, but that would also be something that would be determined during the planning process on how that would happen most efficiently with the most flexibility. Cool. Uh, next, how is high slash flood water going to be distributed to fields for irrigation and agricultural purposes? So this is also something will take some more effort, but the, uh, the turnouts, I think the design of the turnouts will be critical on how this water is distributed. Obviously during lower flow conditions, you want to be able to maintain pressure and apply the water through a sprinkling system. During high flow conditions, we may need to look at more of like a flood irrigation type scenario or having sprinkler capacity where under normal conditions, you might have one wheel line or one pivot operating, but during the high flow conditions, maybe multiple a shareholder could have multiple uh, pivots or wheel lines operating at a time when during lower flow conditions, they wouldn't have the water to operate all of their sprinklers at one time. So there's, there's a number of ways to do it, but some of the ditches in the fields for uh, flood irrigation might need to be maintained to be able to distribute this the high high flows. get more planning to do. That's why we're here. Uh, we're going to jump to, I think, Kimball Lloyd's question. They asked, I think it, this transition is nice, and then we'll go back to Todd. Is the existing pipeline going to the pipe tribe land in operation, or will this pipeline be updated as well? Uh, my understanding is that the last time the tribe asked for water, the pipeline was able to deliver water. I believe that was a few years ago. So that needs to be established and it is possible that that pipeline would need to be replaced or repaired. Certainly it would need to be connected to uh, whatever pressurized irrigation system is installed. Perfect. Um, and then 
With respect to the environmental impacts, how do you foresee that this will impact the current and existing wildlife habitat downstream from the reservoir? That question, I don't really know. Uh, but during the NEPA process, we will have biologists doing various studies to determine what uh, what resources, environmental resources are present, and then to evaluate what impacts various alternatives might have on those uh, environmental resources. So that is a very large, that answering that question is a primary responsibility of the NEPA process. Anything to add on that, Monique? No, you did great. Cool. Okay. Um, if one of the object objectives is recharge the aquifer, how will the reservoir accomplish that differently than the water that is lost in the stretch that has been identified as a problem? The location where the recharge happens will be identified or there's various aquifers and where the primary aquifer is recharged will be identified. There's a high probability that it is in that area. So it's a matter of timing. So during the winter when there's not an agricultural demand for the water, that is the time to try to make sure you maximize the amount of water that's going into this primary aquifer. During late season, when water flows are uh, limited, that's when you would bypass that area. Um, so ultimately, you would put more water into the aquifer than by making sure it's recharging during approximately the 70% of the year when there's not active irrigation happening. And then you would bypass that area during the roughly 30% of the year when there's a much higher need for the water on the, on the fields. But finding that correct balance, the one that's beneficial agriculturally as well as recharging the aquifer is something that's going to require a significant amount of, of study. Uh, okay, we'll do this. And I think this might be a question for Monique. How did the comment period start on April 28th when no one had notice of the 30 day comment period? Why doesn't the 30 day comment period start with this meeting? That's a great question. Uh, the NRCS likes to start the 30 day comment period when the notification goes out. So all of the Kanash residents uh, with PO boxes received a notice uh, to their mailbox um, and that was mailed and should have been received right around April 28th, as well as it was notified in the Millard Chronicle on that same day, as well as the following week. So the two week notice was um, provided to, to the public um, and then we close two weeks after this meeting. We feel like it's a good time to have this meeting right in the middle because you can do a little research and have an idea of the project prior to the meeting, and then we hopefully are answering your questions, and then you have time to provide a comment back to us with the two weeks that are left. Perfect, and I think I'll take a minute to put this little plug in here. You should totally submit comments. We appreciate all of this feedback. We appreciate your ideas and your questions. They're really good questions. Um, if you put them in written comments, we have them like recorded and they are going to go into um they're going to play a big part in what happens next this project is for you guys i think uh, that's so, an important point eleanor is just to yeah. clarify that these questions are great and we appreciate them but you need to submit them in a formal written comment either by emailing it or writing it down physically and mailing it to us so that we have those as a written document so yes Questions in this chat won't count as written comments. We need them separately. Perfect. Thank you, Monique. Uh, back to the engineering type questions. Ready, Lane. Uh, if high flow water, if sorry, if high flow flood water 
is going to be put into a sprinkler, how is the high water debris that plug sprinklers going to be dealt with? Uh, one of the main purposes of the debris basin slash reservoir is to control debris. And there are a number of methods for filtering or screening the water before it goes into the pressurized system. So that's a very common part of design of a pressurized irrigation system. We at France and Civil Engineers have uh, designed pressurized irrigation systems all over Utah and uh, Idaho. And the debris in the pipeline is always a significant issue that has to be addressed. That will need to be addressed. Um, and there are a number of methods to do that. You just have to find the best one that's the most uh, cost effective that does the job. Great. Uh, back to the, we're flipping a little bit, but I'm okay with that on an emotional level. I appreciate your questions, Todd. Uh, Todd said, if I'm not mistaken, the mailing included no mention of a 30-day comment period. In other words, it provided no notice of a comment period, let alone 30-day period. Monique, do you want to? Yeah, I can take that. I actually pulled up the flyer. Um, I can't share my screen with you. Um, but if you look in the center column, it says public scoping meeting, and then there's a box that has the information about the meeting. And then it says written comments are requested between April 28th and May 28th. And then um, over on the side, there's all the information of how you can submit those comments. So I, I would encourage you to go back and look at that notice that you received. Yeah, and those were the notices that were mailed out physically, right, Monique? That's correct. And the information's on our website as well, mm -hmm. which is where you had to go to get to this meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, back to engineering. So will the reservoir be lined to maximize storage or be constructed to maximize recharge? I do not have an answer to that question off the top of my head. Um, that uh, We have to understand more about the aquifer, where that recharge happens, where is most beneficial, um, it's it's possible that even the using the flood channel might be a good way to recharge the aquifer. So there's there's a lot of study that needs to happen to figure out the best way to do this. A liner might be part of the reservoir, or um, might not. Yep, I would also add that that's that's where we are in this process is looking at those options for this project. Nothing has been super, we haven't decided on anything yet. We're at the start of this where we want to make the best decisions. And in order to make the best decisions, we have to look at the needs and the resources that we have available. So that's where we are right now, Todd, is trying to like find out which one of those we want to move forward with or a different one. Um, I think we're caught up on questions in the chat. I know that there might be a couple people with Brandon Stevenson in person. Um, yeah, Jason Dodds, I think it's important to note that this project is in its infancy. We are going to take almost a year to come up with a best fit plan, then another six months for an engineering design. So we're definitely not in a rush because we want to take time to get this right. Um, so I know that there are a couple people with, you're welcome, Todd. Thank you for your questions. We appreciate it. Really, we do. Um, Brandon Stevenson, if there are any questions in the in-person meeting, I just want to throw that out there, make sure that y'all are alive. And if you put a question, if anybody put a question in the chat that I missed or that we didn't um, answer well enough for you, please let me know. We can take time, go back to it. This is to provide you with the information that you want. Brandon Stevenson says, no questions from the in-person meeting. Cool. 
we'll give it just another minute in case anybody else wants to throw out any last minute questions. Um, we're here. It's not like we're trying to escape from you. So we'll give it just a minute. Um, Lane, will you go back to the slide that has the website information or the comments um, information? So I think one more previous. Perfect. So we'll keep that up there for just a second if you guys want to write any of that down. Um, that is how you submit comments. We want them. We, uh, we want them and they need to be written down. Um, like I said, these, these chat questions are great. And it would be great if you could submit those as comments because they won't count as comments here in the chat, if that makes sense. So I think, yeah, yeah. So we'll give it just one more minute. Uh, thank you for coming to the meeting. I see that there's another a question about opportunities to comment. So we receive all the comments during this process. Uh, we do our best to address those comments in the planning document. There will be additional meetings throughout this planning process, and the planning document will be released for additional public comments that will, will be addressed so that yeah, there are multiple opportunities to participate in the planning process. Uh, the goal is to get this right and to best meet, meet the needs. So it's good now to identify all these uh, issues that have been brought up, and I'm sure additional issues will be identified as well in other comments and during the planning process. This, isn't, this meeting isn't like a one and done deal. You guys are stuck with us for a little bit longer. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, Elaine, if I can just, maybe maybe I'm restating this, but the federal government does not want to spend money on something that's not the best best project that can happen. And that's why this environmental assessment process goes through the environmental part, the uh, economic reviews, and everything, so that we get the best project for the bang of the buck for the American people. That's the way the natural resources the uh, Conservation Service has been mandated to use this particular program, and, and that's what we've done. So uh, I think we've been fairly successful. You can look at projects we've done throughout the state, and uh, we're working on several others. So I have 40 of them on the books right now in the state of Utah. So. There's a lot going on. I could even take that link that has the list of the Alpha 66 projects, and I'll include it on this project website in case any of you want to go back and refer to it later. Um, also, when we're done, so like I said, the recording of this meeting is going to be put on the website. I'm also going to put a copy of this presentation that you've just seen on the website so you can go and look at that too. So, so many options. Um, I don't see any other chats or questions. And I'll defer to the project team. If you guys want to call it or if you want to wait one more minute. I think that's good. We look forward to uh, written comments and ideas of uh, ideas for how we can meet the needs as well as issues that needs need to be addressed during the planning process. 
We appreciate your participation. Yes, we do. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys, for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Do some dad, Wayne. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, we're gonna call it. Uh, thank you again for coming. I'm gonna end this call. Feel free to check out our pro project website as has been stated. It's, it's my job. <laughs> I'm gonna keep that updated. It's um, So you can always check back there for updates if you wanna see where we are, what we're doing, all the resources we're gonna put on there. It's gonna be great. So thank you again for coming. We appreciate it. We appreciate questions and comments. Please, please submit written comments. We appreciate them. We value your input. That's the whole point of this. So thank you again for coming. Bye, guys. Thank you, Caroline. Appreciate it.